Welcome to the Fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideau, joined as always by the voice of MMA, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? UFC did it again. Yeah, they did. I feel like uh, the Banger brothers are back. You know, the, um, you and me with the same shirt. Even the Blues brothers, if we start wearing dark glasses... We're, we'll become <laughs> Belushi and um, Ackroyd in no time. I mean, can you sing? Can you sing? Uh, not very well, but I can try. All right. Well, we I might. For effort. If we need it, <laughs> hopefully we don't, but it could be there. It could be there. Uh, we have the same attire. Uh, you look a little better than me, but I'm, I'm trying hard. Like Avis. It's Avis tries great. harder. Um I think Hertz is number one. That would make you Hertz. The one thing that I'm a little upset at you with is that your Tennessee volunteers, um, and they are your Tennessee volunteers now that you live there, they <laughs> they really let me down a little bit, Ken, because, you know, I got this stuff going on with the brackets like everybody else in the United States of America uh, for the most part. Uh, we have this uh, March Madness bracket stuff going on for the NCAA uh, tournament for those people that are living in a cave um and i you know my my i had tennessee in one of my brackets uh on set now we do it a little <laughs> we do it a little different a little different but i i did lose a few of mine with tennessee going down were you surprised that they went down so soon very very. My next door neighbor's kids go there. They don't play. Um, they don't play basketball, but they're big basketball fans. So they were going crazy in the backyard, watching it out on their uh, TV out there. And all the all the neighbors were pulling for uh, the volunteers. They don't have a pro team here, so they really get behind the Tennessee Volunteers. And there's not much to cheer for during football season, unfortunately. So they were hyped, but they got a bad. They got a bad draw. Michigan, I don't think, should have ever been an eleven seed. Is that what they were? Eleven? Yeah, I think it was eleven. They were very low, uh, very low seeded. Um, for what they were, I thought they were like a five to seven team. They were. They had a good season, but um, bad luck for the Vols that they have to face that Michigan team. You know what they were like? Seed. They were a little bit like. And this is a nice segue, and then you could take it over. But they were a little bit like Patty the Batty with their chin up in the air, waiting to get hit. <laughs> we did yes. warn patty we love patty he's been on our show and he's the next superstar by the way but we we did talk to him a little bit about you know keeping that chin uh tucked down again and uh, a little lower and he still has it up high the old timers would say and and i was always preached this by customato you know that guy's got his head up in the air his chin up in the air like a lantern in a storm and uh, <laughs> you don't want to be a lantern in the storm when you're in the ring. Not with your chin. Nope. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, that's a good segue to jump into things. The UFC did it again. They put on a banger. Oh, my God, what a card. Especially if, you're, if you were an English fan. My God, the Brits took over. They, they won all their fights, I think, in the main, on the main card at least. And uh, Patty got it going. Uh, Man, he, he, he loves the drama. He went out there full of excitement, like you said in the first fight, with his chin up in the air. You told him, you gave him some exercises to work on keeping the chin down. The excitement got the better of him. He ignored that advice. Be realistic. Let's be real. Let's be honest about this. If you're going to have a long career, um, you have to learn to uh, dodge a few of those punches, uh, not, not eat all of them. But sometimes, as you said, when it's your debut and you're coming out there on the stage, you want to bring the curtain down to the crowd. You couldn't have picked a better way to do it. But I would say moving forward, um, move that head every once in a while, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and maybe if you don't mind me saying and giving you a little advice, keep that chin a little lower. I know, I know, it's a hell of a chin, but get it down a little bit, hide it a little bit. Been getting shouted at about that for years and years. Been getting shouted at for it for about ten years, and uh, I just can I give you a drill to do that could help you with yeah, that, uh, if you don't mind, um, in, in my own you know little way. Um, put put when when you get in the gym and you're starting after you finish loosening up and you're starting your workout, get in front of the ball. yeah, get in front of the mirror and put a little pad. A little glove, one of those little bag gloves. Put it under your chin, 
and and hold if, it there and hold it there, you know, with the chin low and do do five, six, seven rounds of shadow boxing at a very modest pace, but just to where you get comfortable, which is really not comfortable keeping your chin low, but you get comfortable keeping your chin lower, and and if you want to do something even better. Put your wallet there. I don't think you want to drop your wallet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so put put your wallet there and tell the people in the gym if you want to, because you're that kind of kid. You're the kind of kid put yourself out there. You're the kind of, kind of kid that loves a challenge. Tell the people that, hey, if I drop it two times, it's yours. So then I got a funny feeling. You're going to keep your chin down. Yeah, I'll keep it there then, lad. I'm not losing me though. <laughs> <laughs> Got clipped with a good shot in the first round, but proves what an athlete he is. Absorbed the shot. Got on his back, choked him right out. Got him, got in and out of there. Uh, handled his business. Never disappoints, including on the microphone. So, dying to hear what you think of what you thought about uh, Patty in his second shot out at the UFC. Listen, Dana White's very smart. I mean, he built this thing up to where they sold it for four billion. What was it? Four billion dollars. They sold four billion, it. Yeah, yeah. four point two, whatever. Um, he he's you know he didn't do that by accident. He's a smart guy. He knows that with besides the consistency of good fights that he puts on uh, week to week, as you just highlighted again. But besides that, that. You know, when you turn ESPN on, you turn some of these other channels on, you're going to get one-sided fights because the promoter, once in a while you get a gift, but the promoter is building up his stable of fighters, you know, with the network that he has a sweetheart deal with to keep them undefeated. So while you're going through that build-up process, which takes about two, three years, you're getting a lot of one-sided fights. Because you got the opponents being shipped in to fight the stars or the future stars who they hope will become future stars. But while well, they're getting built up to 6 and 0, 7 and 0, 8 and 0, you know, 20 and 0, 16 and 0, while they're going through all that, you're getting a lot of one sided, non competitive fights. And you don't get that, obviously. You don't get that week to week in the UFC. But at UFC, like anything else, Dana knows you got to have some superstars. And, you know, he had Conor McGregor. He's got a, the big stars, Masvidal out there. Uh, Diaz you brothers. Know, Diaz brothers. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a, obviously there's a few of them. You have to have them. Uh, it's kind of like putting uh, the top on a Christmas tree, that star. You know, that, yeah, you want all the other stuff on a Christmas tree, but that star brings you to the Christmas tree. And, um, and it looks like, it looks like Dana's eye is right that this is the future star. So another McGregor, whatever, whatever you want to compare him to, uh, another superstar, and he's getting the treatment a superstar gets. Uh, they they still got to fight tough guys, but not quite. It shows how smart Dana is. Yeah, it's my way or the highway. Yeah, you know the the menu you get to choose from when you're a fighter at the UFC. It's a menu that is tough. <laughs> there's there's nothing really digestible on that menu. That that's easy for you. You know, it's it's tough chewing. Okay. <laughs> Choice but, number one: a box of rocks. Choice number two: a bag of hammers. <laughs> there it is. And you know, but Patty's been given choice number three, maybe a, a little bit. Still, you know, it, it's still uh, beef jerky, but it, yeah. it, it's. It's a little less because he knows what he's building up right now. And it's apparent that he's right. Look what he drew. Look at the people in the place. Look, he's got the it factor. Forget about the talent in the ring. We'll get to that in a second. He's great with jujitsu. He's great with the grappling. He's great on the floor. He's magnificent. That's his, that's his go-to place. That's his strength. But... He's got the it factor. He's he's got that ring presence, that cage presence. Uh, you know, he's got the charisma. He's got the look. Uh, he know he's smart. He knows what to say. He says the right things to promote himself. Much like Conor McGregor, you know, a different form of him, but much like Conor McGregor. Uh, he he's really terrific. Uh, he's a guy that you want to see again, and he does have explosive talent, and he's reckless enough 
to get your attention. He's just reckless enough with his style to be a star, you know, to bring you in because he's got that vulnerability where he's going to get hit. And and we love it. Let's be honest. People love it. They don't want to see a guy just go through everybody. They want to see a guy, you know, get put on a cliff and, and survive maybe going off the cliff. But they want to see him on the cliff. They, they want to see that danger. They want to see that possibility that the star could get beat, and that he has that vulnerability. So he's got everything. And it, the talent is there. Again, on the mat, magnificent. He's got to tighten up. He's got to, I'm not telling anyone something they don't know by now, but he's got to tighten up his striking where, A, forget about the chin being up in the air. His punches have to become tighter. You know, he, he's got to, we're talking about, you know, stuff on the menu. He's got to go to the butcher shop and get some of that fat cut off the punches. You know, tighten them up a little bit, not so wide, because that's like opening a window. When you got wide punches, it's like having your window open in the middle of the summer. Stuff's going to fly in that window. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And then when you got your chin up in the air like a lantern in a storm with that kind of X on the target, yeah stuff is going to fly in the window like right hands and it's going to hit you on the button and and it happened again he's got a terrific chin but how long you know that's something and and i i joke with him but i was being serious too when we had him on with the interview if you people who haven't seen it go back and see it it's in the archives uh when we had him on after his first ufc fight this was his second obviously ufc fight and when we had him on, I said, look, you got to get in front of the mirror and shadow box the first, just when you're warming up in every day, five, six rounds with something under your chin, you know, put a bag glove under your chin, put your wallet under your chin, you know, and, <laughs> that's and, right, that's and what you're yeah, put your wallet under your chin and make sure there's money in it. Make sure there's money. And the way you're going is going to get fatter and fatter. Make, make sure there's money in it and tell the people in the gym that if it drops to the floor, it's theirs. If it drop, well, you know, well, if it drops to the floor, you have you can go and grab it. It doesn't go to the sweeper; it goes to the guy that sees it first. So, and he laughed. You know, he's he's got that great personality. Uh, he does. How could you not like him? And uh, he laughed. He said, yeah, "I don't want to lose." Uh, you know, with that with that broke. I don't want to lose me money. I don't want to lose me money. Lad. You know, e everything everything with him ends with lad. I don't want to lose me money, lad. Hey, you know, one other thing worth noting there is he's the he's the first and only athlete that uh, Barstool Sports signs as an endorsement. And I think of Davey Page View Portnoy as the Dana White of sports reporting. He's created a media empire over there, not without controversy, but he seems to like lean into every controversial things that happens. I know you did the pizza review with him. But when that guy starts getting behind things, he seems to have the Midas touch. I know people, some people aren't going to like him, especially the woke culture. But man, he got behind Patty. Now Patty's their first, uh, their first sponsored athlete, and they're really like behind him, pushing him on all their social channels. And they've got a huge presence. You know, when you did the pizza review with them, I think it was like one of the biggest pizza reviews he ever did. Certainly the longest. I think it was a thirty-minute pizza review. So he loved to see it. And when they asked him afterwards about the fifty thousand dollar bonus he got, and shout out to the UFC for giving out nine bonuses. They gave, I think, everyone who won a uh, fifty thousand dollar fight of the night bonus, which for some of those people was probably more than double what they were getting paid as they're on the come up but um yeah to dana's credit i think he's listening to some of the noise out there but he got behind him. but anyway they told patty you got the bonus what are you gonna do it you're on the conor mcgregor track and he said i'll tell you one thing if i ever have that paint date if i ever have that conor mcgregor money there'll never be another kid in liverpool eating from a food bank everyone will be eating if i win i'll take you care gotta of the love city. Him. you gotta love them you're saying stuff like that how can you yep. not, how can you not learn all your points well taken and um i second you on the dave portnoy because not not only does he you know he's got the muscle now he's got the strength now uh to promote something but before he got to that place he had the vision he had the vision of what was happening out there with the young people with this thing called streaming you know i i thought it was steaming i didn't know i thought it was a new sauna I never knew what streaming was, Ken. I, you know, for me it was, uh, you know, it was like going in a steam room. Like uh, you steaming, 
You're talking about a new form of steaming? No, no, Teddy, it's streaming. Yeah, but to me, oh. Teddy, that shows strength of character. Everyone knows you're very old school, no email, but the fact that you were able to see that, listen, embrace it, and now look, you're the voice of MMA. You've been taking over the whole sport. I'm, I'm serious. All of a sudden now we have a... And I'm steaming. I'm steaming, we, beaming. We and have a presence in the MMA because you embraced it and showed the ability to change and make those things. I know everyone's going to call me a ass kisser, but it's the truth. You did listen, it. People listen, like we want, appreciate want, all our audience, everybody, whether they're boxing fans or MMA fans, UFC fans, appreciate, love you all. Thank you. Um, but getting back to Portnoy, he, he did. He had the vision to see the future, you know, before it became so obvious. And while it was becoming, I guess, a little bit more obvious, but he, he, was, he was ahead of the curve. And that's, you know, that's why I think he sold part of his company for about $160 million uh, to some gambling. Pen Gaming. Uh, Pen Gaming, right? Uh, gaming site. Great partnership for Pen Gaming. Yeah. The publicity they get from his every week, they're running some kind of gambling special as states be legalized gambling. Dave's ahead of it everywhere, running specials. On this fight for Patty the Batty, they had, if you were in a certain state, you bet 100 on Patty to win by knockout, which obviously you would have won. He'd give you a $100 Carhartt sweatshirt that said Patty the Batty on it. Like, actually cool stuff that you'd want to wear. It's, he's, he's, Dave's got well, his finger on everything. Well, again, to that point that we would that started this conversation is that just like Dana White uh, was able to, you know, set up. Sorry, the, let me clarify. He won by he won by submission. He had to submission. win by knockout yeah. on the bet. Yeah, Sorry submission. about that. But you know, just like we were talking about, you know, Dana White having a vision to do what he did with and take the UFC to where he took it. Uh, you know, Portnoy and and also Dana sees. Patty the Batty is another superstar. Portnoy has the vision to, I mean, this is the only guy they signed. Uh, they they sign this guy because they they see what we're talking about, you know. <laughs> After but, one win in the UFC, they signed Yeah, him. they signed him right away, you know, because, again, just like you saw, he had the vision to see the, the streaming, not steaming, the streaming <laughs> take off with the young people out there. Well, he saw this kid, uh, who he speaks to, the audiences that he speaks to, how people react to him, and that what he could build uh, with this kid. You know, he, he saw that potential. As I called it before, that it, that it factor. Um, it's great to have talent. Uh, you know, you got to have that dedication, talent, mental toughness, all of those things, and he's got all that. But it's even it makes it even better, put it that way, if you have that it factor, the charisma, uh, to make moolah, to make moolah. Um, and he can make moolah. <laughs> he can, he, I love the way, you know, with his confidence, and that's all part of the stick, but how he comes on, he says, but it's not just a stick, he believes it. How he comes on, he says, you gotta get a, uh, you gotta get a bigger place, you know, kind of kind of like, <laughs> kind of like Jaws. We're gonna need a bigger boat. <laughs> You he know? said he wants to sell out the uh, the Liverpool soccer stadium. I think 60,000, people or something. So uh, I'd love to see him get that with his partner there, Molly McCann. That was, she was, man, she, uh, I don't think we have it on the docket, but she won by spinning back elbow and the two of them. What like, a sensational knockout, right? Oh, oh. I mean, God, man, they, these people, Dana these said it right. I was so listening tough. to Dana White's interview afterwards, and he said, you know, not only was it a sensational knockout, whoever did it, but you don't see women knock out women. No, like no, that. No, you're right. Not like that. Nope. Not out cold with this, you know, flat. And then uh, <laughs> I always have mixed emotion with the women's fights, to be honest. I mean, I'm all for equal rights, but I just don't like seeing the women getting knocked out cold. I, I call me old fashioned, but I have such a hard time. And this, the the women are so good now that that their their striking is so effective that it's like it, it it's kind of like a mind, it blows your mind when I'm watching. I'm like, oh my god, these girls are <laughs> they're they're throwing bombs. They they become the, the the talent has increased so dramatically. It's in the skills. It's like man, they are getting getting after it. So congratulations to Molly McCann. But uh, yeah, it would be great to see him get a fight over there in Liverpool at a soccer stadium. Just incredible to think that one kid could, could attract that kind of audience, but he's doing it. 
he certainly is. He certainly is. All right, let's talk about our man. Uh, man, this was a tough one. Dan Hooker loses by knockout to um, Arnold Allen. Um, first round stoppage. Tough loss for Dan. He's dropping down in weight, I think, to 155. Um, he hasn't. He's he, he hasn't had much success lately, and he's such a tough guy and such a good guy. It's hard to see him take these L's, but. Um, I know you watched that one and had some thoughts. What would you think on the uh, first round stoppage, TKO on the feet? First of all, I'll follow what you just said and add to it a little bit about Dan Hooker. Great warrior, fan-friendly fighter, nothing but heart, you know, entertainment. Uh, he's been involved in so many, so many great fights. That's why he has a great backing uh, people love him. How could you not? And one other thing, Teddy, I'm sorry, I said 155. I meant to say he dropped down to 145 from 55. He was campaigning at 55 and had a few L's, and then he went down to 45. Thought it was his new weight class. And, uh, yeah, sorry about that. No, that's no problem. Here's the problem. He, he's trying to find something, but it's kind of like having an old car. And you know what? Other than replacing the engine... When that car gets to a place where it's got too many miles on the odometer, there's not a hell of a lot you can do. You can change the oil. You can drop the weight, as we just said. You could drop the stuff that you got in the trunk. You know what I mean? If you got extra yeah, jacks in the trunk and extra car, um, you know, tires, you can get rid of all that. Make it lighter, just like you'd make the body lighter. You can do all of that. But that mileage on the odometer is not going away. And... He's got a lot of mileage on the odometer. You know, those cylinders have uh, been striking and struck for a long you time. You remember what Poirier did yeah, to him? Oof, for, uh, what they were doing to each other. But, you know, and um, that's the best analogy. Again, I love him. It's not a knock. It's a fact of life. If you're in the striking business, if you're in the fighting business, you know, if you're in this very unforgiving business you know it takes a little bit from you every time you get in that ring that's why i want these guys to get paid and i love what dana does giving these fifty thousand dollar bonuses and i'll say it again you know and i'm not aiming this just at at hearn at barry hearn who does a tremendous job promoting over there across the pond hello everybody across the pond eddie hearn i'm sorry eddie hearn, eddie hearn. The yeah time. but if he starts giving bonuses i'll call him his right name and when <laughs> And, and <laughs> hello to all of my brothers and sisters across the pond. I love you all. I miss you guys all the time. Can't wait to have crumpets with you. I'm going out there in late April uh, to speak to people. They're bringing me out there. And also they're, they're inviting me to be at the, at the Dillian White Fury fight. Um, to go there if I want to go. So. Oh, you didn't tell me that. Yeah, no, I meant I to tell you. That. I thought I did. I thought I plan. sent a text to you and Rob. I'm sorry. I thought I did. But um, yeah, they they just recently got in touch with my daughter and said, "Does your father want to go out to the fight?" and and was set up where he'll go to the pre-fight and the post-fight festivities and blah 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 and all that stuff. So um, so I'm trying to see if I've change the dates a little bit and go maybe a little later to be at the fight and then go and do what I'm going to do out there, which is to tour different places. If they got room on that private jet they're sending for you, I might have to meet you over there. Well, I was the thinking Boston about Marathon. going on your private jet. That was, <laughs> that was my thought of how I would actually comfortably get over there. But um, you're always welcome. You know that. But, uh, I'm, yeah, so I'm... It looks like we might adjust it to be out there for the fight. I haven't committed 100% to it. And like I said, I'm going out there to speak at probably about five, six different places, uh, clubs, uh, places where we're, we're, we'll meet with the people and we'll talk and answer questions and do meet and greets and just see all the beautiful people uh, that are over there that we communicate with all the time. But now I'll be able to go and give them a hug and a handshake. Um, so the... The bottom line with Hooker is you got to love what he's given us. And that's not, I'm not forgetting that. I'm not forgetting that. And, oh, and I, I digress for a second. I wanted to finish my thoughts. 
I would wish that the promoters in boxing, not just Hearn, but the promoters in boxing, and I, I know it's not my right to spend your money, and I'm, I'm not. I'm just suggesting that when the guys on the, on the card, not the ones that are getting paid the millions of dollars or millions of pounds, but the other guys that aren't getting paid as much, you know, if they put on a, a great show, a special show, which they do uh, quite often. When they do do that, give them a bonus. I, I would just love it. I mean, I think you got a few extra, you know, shillings uh, available. That and then again, I shouldn't, I shouldn't aim this just for her and for a, over in Europe. I'm, I'm talking about here. Whether it's Aram, whether it's you know whoever, whoever it is, whether it's PPC. You know, uh, obviously, um, without Heyman or wh- whoever, that when you got these guys on a, on the card that put on a sensational fight once in a while, and they give so much to themselves, and you know they're not making a big money, and they're not one of the, they're not one of the golden childs that are signed with you that that has a you know great amateur record that had a a medal in the olympics uh that that you know they're going to get paid and they are getting paid more than the regular guy even at the early stages of their career when you got the guys that are coming in that don't have that backing don't have that footing if you will uh, that benefit give them when when they deserve it give them you know throw them a bone you know, uh, throw them a bonus. Give them something a little extra. Uh, they appreciate it, you know, and and it will get around that the people find on the undercards if they put a special show on. And quite often, we don't get good undercard fights, Ken. So it'll, it'll get the word around that if you put on a special show on the undercard, you're going to get a bonus. You know, you're gonna get extra. Not, not only would I say not too often, I'd say almost never. I bet you it's 90, 95 percent that you can predict who's gonna win every undercard fight on most boxing shows. And if not, they're probably two guys that they just found, like you know, at a local gym to fill a card. Because if there's someone good, they're either gonna be mismatched while they're getting developed on the undercard, and they're, or they're gonna be like an opponent just there to like get in there and get lumped up. Hundred percent. It's the same so, thing every time. So. That's that's what I said. And again, I know one time I said it and heard somebody mentioned it to her <laughs> and heard said, hey, tell Teddy be free. Yeah, he's free to use his money to do that. It's a great idea. <laughs> tell, you know, tell, Teddy, tell Teddy that's awfully nice of him yeah, to spend yeah, my money. I get just for I get it. I, he he's uh he's a smart, witty guy. Uh he's been greatly Very suc- witty. greatly successful. He does a great job. Um and, and again, I'm not being a wise guy trying to go into his wallet. I'm just saying for everybody that it, it would be a good idea. And I don't think I'm letting any secrets out, Ken, when I say I think these guys can afford it. And again, I'm not trying, you know, to get them to a different tax bracket. <laughs> I'm not talking about that much. I'm just talking about what you can do, what you can, what you're privileged enough to do, what you're... What, what you're, what you're blessed with the position and what you have to do. What really you're blessed. You can do it. That's all I'm saying. Uh, that that it can be done. Eddie made the mistake of putting on those fights in the summer during COVID in his backyard, which basically showed that he lived in a castle. <laughs> so no one's gonna be crying for him financially. I agree. But um, to finish up, to get back to to really the the gladiator hooker um everyone's time comes you know and i think you're seeing that and you've been seeing that it's not going to change things dropping down a weight uh you know you bang at a rock long enough and it's a rock it's a solid rock gargantuan rock and you're banging at it you're banging it at it with a hammer and it's People laugh at you. What the hell is a hammer going to do to that rock? That gargantuan rock. And then you know what? One day after about a year or two of hitting away with the hammer, you come by and you tap it and a piece of the rock comes off. That's what happens. That's the course of nature in 
what we're talking about in this difficult, unforgiving business is they, the rock chips, the rock chips. And you're seeing the chipping of that rock, of the gargantuan rock, the bolder, bolder rock of Hooker. You're seeing it now. And I don't think it's going to change. I think it's going to continue. Um, so, and again, I say this with love and admiration for him. Not in any other vein, in any other way at all. Uh, only that he's given us so much, so much um, of himself. I don't want him to give too much. So, anyway. Yeah, he's dropped Four, he dropped four of his last fights, the, the four losses, two knockouts and two submissions. And even the one he went, he won, went to a decision. So he's just, well, man, he's been in tough. And uh, Yeah, tough. And he, it's not going to ch change. He's going to be in tough. And again, exactly. he's, yeah. he's, you know, he's taken so much. And uh, I think that you're seeing some of the effects of that. As far as Allen goes, he, he should get an endorsement with the Energizer Bunny. He should, really, with the, with the alkaline batteries because he's one of those little toys that, are, that I have for my grandchildren where you wind it up and they just go. They just go. You wind this guy up and he just goes. He just punches. He punches and punches and he just, I mean, he's a punching machine. He's he excited. He was doing some sharpshooting too. Yeah, he but he, he, he it was a lot of sharpshooting I saw. Uh, not, not, not at that point. Early on, to your point, I saw him looking for the right, he's a southpaw. I saw him using his legs, looking for the right spot to get in, um, being responsible, <laughs> being smart, you know, showing versatility, looking for the right spot to attack. I saw that. I, I did. But once he caught him, I think it was a straight left hand. Once he staggered, got an effect out of Hooker, it was, it was the Energizer Bunny. It was that wind-up machine. He was just chucking, chucking leather. And <laughs> I'm telling you, it's exciting. It's uh, enthralling to watch. Uh, you know, he's, he's another guy that, you know, he... I know he's, I can't say he jumped on the scene, but, you know, you watch him and you say, I want to watch him again. I mean, that's where you walk, that's where you walk away from that fight. I want to watch him again. The thing for him, just like we talked about Patty the Batty, the things that I would correct or that I would think that need to be looked at a little bit from the striking standpoint, for Allen, you we love that you're throwing that many punches, but you have to be more responsible from a defensive end to where you're going to get caught if you're throwing that many without a defensive posture, without a defensive move. If you're just throwing that many, a million punches, you're just throwing that many punches and your head is in the middle, you're, you're going to get caught. And he got caught. He got caught by a hooker with a left hook. And he showed a great chin. In the midst of all those punches, he got caught a left hook by Hooker. It could have dropped him. It staggered him a little bit, but he just kept going. He went right back to punch. What I'm saying is that's a warning. That's a warning of things to come. If you're staying in the middle throwing that, we love it. We're going to applaud it. But your chin ain't going to love it because you will be vulnerable to things like that, getting caught in between. My, for me, if I was training them from a striking standpoint, Ken, I would throw, say, five or six of those, then a little head movement out of the middle, off to the side, left or right, and then throw from there. And then, you know, when you want to reset, weave back to the other side don't reset in the middle we back to the other side and again go back to three four five six seven punches whatever you want from the side and then off to the other side again every once in a while get your head out of the freaking middle that's basically what i'm saying don't stay in the middle where you're a sitting duck where you're a reliable target where the guy knows where to find you you know get your head off to the side every once in a while but i love this energy uh, loved his offense, you know, loved his chin when he absorbed that punch and he just 
you know, he just kept going. Uh, even though he did get staggered a little bit, uh, you know, he he went right back at it. That was his 11th win in a row, Ted. It moves him to 18 and one. He's got one decision loss uh, big way through his career. But man, he's on a uh, he's on a tear. I wasn't terribly familiar with him. I mean, obviously, I've seen him and heard of him, but I wasn't really closely paying attention before. But he's got my attention now. That is uh, a good win for him to get on the resume. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was. It was uh, not just a good win, but it's how you win. And the way he won, uh, it, it, it fit the bill, you know, to, as we said earlier, to get, it, to get the right people's attention, to get the fans' attention, to get, obviously, the boss, uh, Dana White's attention. It was, it was a real good job, really good job. Well, that brings us to the main event, and again, the card was so exciting, and the uh, main event didn't disappoint. We got um, Brit England's own Tom Aspinall gets a first-round knockout, uh, sorry, first-round armbar stoppage of um, Alexander Volkov, who's, uh, you know, he's one of those top-in-class guys, gatekeeper now, if you will. But Tom Aspinall, huge step-up fight for him in home in front of the crowd. Apparently, he's been training with Tyson Fury. I saw Tyson Fury put out a message to him wishing him good luck on on social media. Um, you know, always good to have the heavyweight champion of the world sending you a big shout-out like that. So, congratulations to Tom Aspinall. But how'd you like it? How'd you like the striking from Tom Aspinall and then to finish him off with that armbar? You know, kind of like... I, I understand the difference, but I'm still... I'm going to say it this way coming out of the gate. A little bit like with... Patty, the batty, uh, maybe a star is born. Um, it, not quite to that level because of all the other factors and elements that I already went over that are attached to a Patty the batty with charisma, the it factor, all of that stuff. But he did himself well. Um, he really, uh, he, he really made a hit. Uh, and and got people's he got my attention, but he got Dana White's attention. He got the audience's attention of what he didn't already have. I'm not saying he didn't already have some people, but to do it against a veteran, uh, a veteran, a solid, solid veteran like Volkov, he uh, he did a great job of announcing himself to the party. You know, uh, I'm here. I'm here. He he really did. And what I saw as far as him being here, I saw a guy that reminded me of along the lines of a conventional fighter, a good, solid, in my sport, boxer, a guy whose legs are always under him, a guy who's looking to go forward in a responsible, proper, technical way, a, a guy that is... Always set the punch with power because he's got the right technique because his legs are under him. Uh, he's not leaning. He's not getting ahead of, you know, the bottom portion of himself, which always has to be there if the upper portion of yourself is going to be able to deliver at its best with balance, um, you know, and that kind of uh, position. I saw a guy moving his head like, again, like a professional fighter. Uh, I saw a guy throwing the right punches, you know, not with uh, the big loops in them like we see with some of the guys. Nice, straight, fundamental, solid punches, accurate punches with decent hand speed. I, I thought I was watching a heavyweight prospect for a minute there, you know, in, in my business. Uh, especially when he slipped that punch, bang, right in him. That was beautiful. Yeah, if he's going to be in this, if he's sparring with Tyson Fury to get ready for these fights, you're not going to get much better in terms of technicalities from a heavyweight fighter and foot movement, well, head movement. It showed. Yeah. You know, it showed whatever. I'm not there to see it, but I don't have to be. Uh, the being around Tyson Fury and whatever that work uh really is whatever whatever the the true amount of work i don't know that he does with fury in his camp it showed it, it, i have to say it showed because of what i just described uh that that this guy made me think of a fighter and 
a fighter that, you know, has been taught properly. A boxer, when I say a fighter, they're all fighters. And I loved it. I, I loved it. And then I loved it even more because I always talk about being dimensional and you have to be well-rounded. I loved it when then he got on the floor on the mat and showed again not just how physical, how strong, and that he had this and that uh, as far as those kind of abilities. We need to see those those physical abilities, but how smart and technical he was, how good he was uh, on, the, on the mat, how versatile his game is. I mean, again, for me, he was the guy coming to the party that you didn't really know was at the party. You know, and you kind of went there, you kind of went there looking to see the other people that you knew were going to be at the party. And all of a sudden, this guy got announced. Hey, I'm over here. He's winning, <laughs> I'm over he's here. winning in a row, every single win by stoppage. His only, he has two losses. One he lost, he got caught in a heel hook, and one he got disqualified for illegal elbows. So he's been destroying everyone he's fighting. On an eight-fight winning streak, Volkov was number six in the heavyweight rankings. Uh, Tom was number 11. I'm curious to see where he is now when the new rankings shake out, but he's getting there. I wouldn't be surprised. He's sitting nah, he's in there sure for a title, is. one or two more fights, and they're probably going to put him in there. He brings a crowd. He looked that good. Yeah. He looked that good. Definitely. And, and um, when you watch him, you only think that he's got an upside. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Because he's not a used-up guy. He's not a guy that has already reached Mount Everest you know what I mean he didn't know uh, there's a guy who's still climbing there's a guy who's still climbing yeah he hasn't really put his flag at the top of the mountain yet and he's only going to get better you see the potential for that and he's smart and you see that and um and again I'd say you know the finishing the the cherry on the the cherry on top was how good he was when he got to the mat I mean you know that that he showed those grappling skills um, and techniques. So I, as I said earlier, he made me leave and saying, when am I going to see him again? And that's the best thing you can say about these guys is when you leave saying, when can I see him again? When can I see him again? Then you know you did something good. Then you know you're on the right track. Like I said, the place was an electric factory over there. Once those once those British fans got rolling and the English guys just kept winning. So uh, fantastic, fantastic night from the UFC. We're going to discuss some of the other ones now, but we'll uh, we'll go with Rob and put some time on the clock and do a couple rapid fire uh, topics. Yeah, well, we're putting it together, Ken. I just want to put a shout out there to our beautiful fans to watch this Thursday. Because we got a good interview coming up with a, a guy that you might have oh, heard of. Yeah. A, a guy you might have heard about. A guy you might have heard right. about. Uh, That's right. The great Triple G. And while we're doing that, Teddy, let me take a minute to remind everyone that if you want to stay healthy and you want to do the best you can do, you got to make sure you're crossing your T's and dotting your I's. And there's no better way to do it then with some Athletic Greens every single day. As you know, all day, every day, we're on the Athletic Greens train. If there's one thing that I could take in my daily regimen, and people ask me that a lot, it would be Athletic Greens. I'd never miss it. You want to make sure you get in your fruits and vegetables. If nothing else, even if your diet is a mess, maybe you ate pizza and hot dogs all day for the last couple of weeks, but the one thing that you can assure yourself is Make sure that you're getting your vegetables, fruits and vegetable servings. This Athletic Greens has multiple servings of fruits and vegetables in every dose. I take it every single morning. The, the people that created this spent 10 years with the top doctors and nutritionists to develop this formula. It's got 75 whole food sourced ingredients. It's got everything you need, antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, probiotics, prebiotics, you name it. Go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas to take advantage of the offer for our, for our listeners. 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Athleticgreens.com. Use promo code ATLAS, A-T-L-A-S, for 10 free travel packs with your first order. Teddy, three minutes on the clock. Let's talk some, let's do some rapid fire. First one up. We had, oh, I asked you to go back and watch this one after the fact. Uh, Paul Craig wins by triangle over Nikita 
Krylov. It looked like Krylov was just going to ragdoll him. He was running through him like a nice little hot butter. He got on top of him and was smashing him. And, and Paul Craig throws up the uh, triangle choke. How'd you like it? Yeah, he was on top of him, pounding and grounding him. As you talked about, elbows, you know, fists, all that nasty stuff. And, you know, it, it looked, as you said, like uh, like Krylov had what he wanted. You know, he, he had his way. And it took me back to the Gracies. Early, the infancy of UFC. You know, how many years ago that is? 20, whatever it is. But I remember the great legendary Gracies. They'd be on the floor, you know, doing the jujitsu thing. And... They'd be getting pounded and grounded. Your daughter was over. And then all of a sudden, whoop, it was over. Except the Gracies had their legs wrapped around the guy's neck and <laughs> they, they submitted him. Well, that's what I was reminded of with this Craig. That it, it was, he's getting pounded all of a sudden like a python, like if you were in the jungles of Africa and a python snake dropped out of the tree and got around you. Well, I guess you know what's going to happen. You're going to get choked out. You, it's over. And that's what happened. With the sudden, suddenness of a python dropping out of the trees or Gracie on his back, the legs were wrapped. He made one little mistake, did Krylov, and it was over. The legs were wrapped around him, triangle, choke, and it was over. Really was, really, really was something to watch, to, to watch the expertise of somebody in that kind of way. At one point, it looked like Craig was almost knocked out. He got hit with a shot, and then he got hit with a second shot right after, almost kind of woke him up. You ever seen that happen before in boxing, where a guy looks like he's out, gets cracked again, and he's like, kind of brings him back to like back to life? Yeah, I have seen that. I, I have seen that, actually. And it's, it's a good point on your part. But the thing that really, again, was uh, the admiration I walked away with to see somebody that good at their thing, you know, in this case, jujitsu, but and and to have the ability to endure, to endure, to get to where he had to get to, to use it, uh, it was magnificent. It was magnificent. I thought to about see. what you always. I thought about what you always say is the ability to remain calm in an uncalm environment. He's getting mauled, and he continued to exhibit patience. Patience, waiting for the guy to make a mistake. But patience, while he's getting punched and elbowed in the face, takes a special kind of person to be able to like wait and set that up. And, and, and then to execute is just, it's unbelievable. Dis display of toughness. Yeah, it takes a certain fortitude, a certain character. Those are all the things that you need intertwined with the talent, the ability, the technique, all of those other ingredients that make somebody great. Well, awesome. Congratulations to Paul Craig. We get a fresh three minutes on the clock, Teddy. One of the things that you always talk about when we talk about a, 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 a boxer's record as they get and build up, the record means nothing. I need to know who they're fighting. And that was on display this Saturday at the theater at Madison Square Garden. Congratulations to the uh, Puerto Rican prospect, Edgar Belanga, for selling out the arena. But man, not a great performance from him. He, uh, you know, he got the win. He got the decision over Steve Rolls, 97-93, 96-94, 96-94 on the cards. Considering like what a favorite he was in the house fighter, that's actually probably closer than it, that, that, that it, the fight was probably closer than it sounds on the judges' scorecards. But um, yeah, he didn't look good against Steve Rolls, a guy who Triple G just embarrassed. I mean, he had his way with him. Um, what'd you think? How'd you like it? Well, I mean, to your point, you know, uh, his record looked better than he did. He didn't look good, Belanga. And he's a local kid. I want to say he looked great. He's from the Bronx, from New York. Uh, but he, I don't know if it's too strong a word, but some people might say he got exposed. Uh, he, he's, I, Rose is really a middleweight. He fought Triple G at middleweight, I believe. But good point. he, he's fighting that super middleweight Belanga, and I'm telling you, he was in there with a middleweight, but whether it's super middleweight or middleweight, Belanga's big. He's a big, that's the first thing that struck me. You know, he's undefeated, he's got that great record, 18 and 0, 16 knockouts, but he's big. He is big, massive, strong man. Kind of like a Munguia, uh, you know, 
uh, a little bit like a Benavides at super middleweight. Yeah. You know, that kind of big, just a big guy. But he's got a lot to learn. He's got a lot to learn. They better start learning it. I understand this is what they do. What Top Rank does, what all the promoters do. They get a kid that they want to make into a star and they, you know, they, they feed him chopped meat. You know, they, they feed him easy fights all the way up to they get to a place where now they finally got to fight somebody. And sometimes they're not doing them a favor because when they finally get to that place, sometimes they're not ready. Right now, he don't look like he would be ready, depending on who's there. But he don't look like he would be ready. He's got to develop more. He's undeveloped. In areas that if you're going to be a prize fighter, if you're going to be a world champion, you can't afford to be undeveloped. Yeah, you could be big and strong, beautiful, but you better learn how to use that big and strong, you know, ability or that big and strong, you know, attributes uh, in, in the proper way uh, with the sweet science. And he needs to, he needs to still learn that. Also, and maybe they did him a favor, but who thought it's a good idea to keep putting these fights on at midnight? I mean, I was falling asleep. I, I might have missed a little. I was falling asleep. I wake up, I say, oh, gee, there's only a minute and a half left. It was three minutes when I, when I was starting to watch it. Um, I, 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 you put it on at midnight, it's getting over at one o'clock in the morning. But maybe they did a favor because not a lot of people saw it because he didn't look that good. But... Uh, because maybe only two or three people watched the damn thing because it was on, you know, so damn late, so damn late. But the most important thing that they got to get out of this, that there, there has to be a memo sent to the people with Belanga. Uh, Belanga. Uh, okay, you were a good promoter. They're building you up. You got a beautiful record, but you got to have more than that. You got to, whatever it takes, you got to get something to help you, to polish you, to make you better you look like george foreman in the middleweight or the super middleweight class but um you know what george foreman didn't have to do as a heavyweight what a middleweight and a super middleweight have to do they have to be a little further along in the technical departments although george foreman for me he's one of the greatest of all time in the heavyweight class yeah, I'll just add that, like, when, when, when we're doing that breakdown and analysis, to your point, you said it at the beginning, like, I want so bad for this kid to be a superstar and be good. This is just, as we say every week, we're just speaking the truth. I want him to keep knocking people out. It's unfortunate that, he's, that he didn't look that good against Rolls because I'm rooting for him. I like him. He's, like you said, Teddy, Puerto Rican kid from New York. I wish him all the best, but, uh, you know. I want to add one thing to it, Ken. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Rolls. To his credit, he's 38 years old. He, he gave a good effort. But the first half of the fight, he was fighting to survive. I, I think that... 100%. He was intimidated by that record. L like a lot of people are going to sometimes be. And he when he realized about halfway through, Ken, that this guy... And I'm not trying to not, not belong. I'm just trying to do my job. I'm doing my job. And about halfway through... He realized that Belanga's record, as I started this thing, and you started this when you introduced, when you got me started with it, that Belanga's record was better than him uh, at this stage. His record is better than he is. And when he realized, when Rose realized this after the sixth round, somewhere around there, he started then fighting more to win. And he started winning. He started winning. He he won all his rounds late, and he started to win. And he, if he had realized that going in, which other people will now, but if he had realized that earlier going in, he might have won this fight. Matter of fact, there's some people out there, if they're being truthful, they might even say, Teddy, oh no, he would have won this fight. But he, he might have won this fight had he realized what he realized late if he had realized it earlier. So they really need to do their job. The people that are resp have the responsibility of doing that job, that look after this kid, of really getting him the help that he needs to become better. Yeah, and you're right. It's Steve Rolls for the first at least two or three rounds. He did look very, I don't want to say scared because I don't think he was scared, but he was super tentative every time. Every time Berlanga would start well, I think to intimidated get might have been yeah, fair. Very, I think intimidated I think 100 uh, is, is fair. Certainly looked that way. Because he, 
he he didn't know what he had in front of him except what the record told him. Yep. And, and then by the time he did the exploration, he did the work <laughs> to explore the explore the territory you know to find out what he had well he realized hey what the freak am i doing here let me try let me do more than try to survive let me start throwing right hands behind the jab let me start putting punches together and see what the hell happens here and you know what happened he won rounds that's what happened he hit the guy he controlled the guy that's what happened yeah well, Teddy, you already mentioned it, but we've got an awesome interview coming up with the legend Triple G on Thursday that we did last week. But uh, before we go, I want to get uh, just a quick breakdown for the fans. You talked about it at length with um, Triple G, his fight coming up with Murata. You pointed out a lot of um, a lot of great uh, great points about that fight and what he had and what and what Triple G is going to be dealing with when he gets over to Japan on April 9th with with Murata. But um, quickly in the last um, this last quick take section, give me section, give me um, give me what you're looking for in that fight and what the fans should expect to see from Triple G versus Murata on April 9th in Japan. All right, ring the bell. Go ahead, there it is. Okay, the clock the clock has started. Um, first of all, a couple of X factors. Uh, number one, it's in Japan. You mentioned it. You got to go all the way over to Japan. You got to acclimate. That's going to be difficult uh, at this point in his career, at this point in his life, at being almost forty years old. That that could be more difficult than people think. And they have a quarantining uh, situation where they quarantine you over there. And as Triple G was very honest, he he talks like he fights, very honest, right to the point. They don't even know what that's going to be, how long they're going to be quarantined over there. So that could put uh, a fly in the ointment as far as your preparation. So he's got a couple of things that he normally doesn't have to deal with that he has to deal with. He's got an Olympic gold medalist. So he's got a guy who had plenty of fights like he did. He, he was a silver medalist in Olympics, Triple G. He's got a guy with all that amateur experience, that amateur confidence, fighting all kinds of different styles, was a gold medalist. He's He's fighting against that. And a guy who also has the belt too, uh, like him, has one of the belts uh, as a world champion. And a guy who's a good body puncher like Triple G and a guy who's in front of you. Guy that you don't have to look for. And that's good for Triple G, that he won't have to look for. What might not be good for Triple G is that the day after the fight, he turns 40. So, you know, he, he's getting up there. And, you, you just, and it's been almost a year and a half. I think to be accurate, it's been a year and four months since Triple G last fought. And it has been even longer for Murata. But Murata has been, uh, well, Murata's younger. So he can handle that maybe, you know, a little bit better or a little differently. But again, bet between all those factors that I just pointed out, it's going to be interesting. Really, here's the only thing that matters. You know, it's kind of like What's My Line. You remember that that show, that TV show, What's My Line, <laughs> yeah. where the guys would come and you had to figure out who was who? Well, and then at the end, will the real Mr. Thompson please stand up? And you find out if you were right or not, right? Well, this is going to come down to will the real Triple G please stand up? That's what this comes down to. Does the real Triple G still exist? Does he still exist, the one that we remember? And will he be there in Japan in that ring with Murata, who's who would not be able to beat the old Triple G? There's no doubt about that in my mind. Yeah, he would not. Agreed. But but he's he's not chopped liver, as somebody might say. You know, he's not a pushover. Um uh, but he wouldn't have been a threat to him in the past. Is he a threat to Triple G now? At 40 years of age, that's the question. Yeah, I think Triple G at times has, um, I don't want to say fought to the level of the competition, but at times he hasn't looked as good as he can look when he's really pressed and really um, up for the fight. Like the first uh, Canelo fight, for instance, even the second one. When he brings his A game, he's just, he's awesome. And um, you know that's a great point there, Ken. I want to I want to piggyback off that point because that's one of the questions I threw at him in the interview that will be up this Thursday. Is 
at this point in your life with all the accomplishments you've made 20 consecutive middleweight title to oh my goodness um you know all the belts uh all the money that you made that you deserve and you earn uh with everything everything that you've accomplished at this point in your life at this point in your career what motivates you what gets you up just to your point what gets you up to be up at that place you have to be every time you step in a ring fully motivated full you know prepared in every facet of your game how how do you still get to that place at this point in your career yeah. that's i think that's the most important telling point in breaking this fight down and handicapping this fight is to try to understand that and that will be in in some ways the telling of what happens in that ring in japan yep should be a good one looking forward to seeing uh triple g in action he always brings the excitement um that's all we got this week teddy am i missing anything no just uh your tennessee volunteers <laughs> i'll give a shout out to my my man regis pro gray got a uh Knockout win over the week over the weekend in Dubai. Classy fighter, yeah. classy guy, smart guy, southpaw, good fighter. Fights fights good fighters. Fought a real close fight a couple years ago with Josh Taylor. Yep. Uh, he, you know, here's the funny thing about it: he lost that fight very close uh, over across the pond uh, in Taylor's home. You know, obviously hometown. But uh, he's co he's continued to look better and better and. I don't know that I could say that about Taylor yeah. <laughs> because Taylor did not look good uh, in his last fight, which most people thought Catterall beat him. Uh, but but just maybe more importantly is uh, whether he got the gift or he didn't get the gift, and I think he got a gift with that decision. He didn't look good, but Progres uh, continues to look good. He's a slick southpaw. He could go catch you. He could box with you. Uh, he's, you know, he's, He's remained as, uh, I think, still one of those top guys. Yeah, and one of the things I love about Regis Progre is he's like an intellectually curious kid. He's 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 a really nice guy. He's not as well known as some of the other big name fighters, but I'm telling you, when he gets the big shot, I think people will really like him. He speaks from the heart. He's very honest. One other thing regarding Josh Taylor, I saw he was, uh, you know, sometimes Josh Taylor has some kind of bad behavior i gotta say it outside of the ring he's got like you know he's been caught on camera drinking and saying some racist stuff but then most recently he said someone sent out a tweet about um cat that catarol got robbed or something and and josh taylor said because you know the british board of boxing said they were going to call in the judges and they wanted to talk and review it so josh taylor sent out a tweet a retweeted a tweet about Catterall, uh, a disputed decision, and he said, oh, you better call the police. In other words, like, oh, go cry to someone else about it or something. And Catterall just responded like, this guy's a real class act, this guy, Josh Taylor. But Josh Taylor's done a few things like that. I get that he wants to hype the fight. He gets all aggressive. It, to me, it's too much, but I get if that's what he has to do to get his head right for the fight. But sometimes he just always seems to be stepping over the line. And it's just been a lot of incidents like this with Josh where he's like, like I said, out drinking, saying crazy stuff, talking crazy. And now with the Twitter, I just like to see a little bit less of that kind of behavior from Josh and just like stick to fighting and like stop trying to be like super aggressive with people outside of the obvious combat in the ring. Anyway. Um, no, no, I, I'm going to say some more for that because I understand what you're saying and I agree with it. Um, I... At the end of the day, you could do whatever you want. Like we're talking about some of these guys, you know, how they're clever as promoters and they build themselves up, get more eyeballs on them, all that. And and whatever way you go about doing it, if it works. But at the end of the day, you better be able to fight. Yep. At the end of the day, take care of your business in the ring. Yeah. That's uh, you know, it's like that old boxing joke where they're at a club show that goes on every Friday night fights. They're at a club show, and back in the days, and uh, and the priest, there's a priest, a neighborhood priest who goes to all the fights, and he's standing there against the wall. He's watching the fights. Uh, the next opponent gets in. He gets in. And he goes to his corner. He kneels down. He blesses himself. He looks up at heaven. You know, for a little support support right we all need support and and then he gets ready to answer the bell and one of the old fight fans standing next to the priest says father 
Does that really help? And the priest looks at him and says, only if you can fight, son. <laughs> you know, so at the end of the day, don't forget that part. You know, it's pretty important. And, and in some ways, and I'm glad you touched on it, his behavior in a way where he gets crazy and all that stuff and, you know, worked up, I want to kill you, all that stuff, it's working against him in a way that it worked against him in his fight against Catterall because he looked ridiculous that like he he wanted we saw it at the pre-fight stuff uh at the way in all that stuff how you know he wanted to get after him and he was huffing and puffing like uh i was telling that story to my grandchildren the other day like the big bad wolf huffing and puffing and blow the house down but when he ran into a secure house with brick he huffed and puffed himself out and he didn't blow any houses down and he reminded me of the big bad wolf with Catterall, he huffed and puffed to blow that house down, but he wound up he wound up being frustrated. He he wound up overshooting the guy. He wound up doing almost nothing. I mean, he was so huffed and puffed, so to speak, and and so embroiled to to kill the guy, which you should never be at that place in any professional realm. You're supposed to be calm. You're supposed to outsmart the guy. Yeah, you could out-physical the guy, out-strike the guy, out-speed the guy, everything. But you got to be calm because when you're not calm, the old pros just always tell us and tell me and Cuss would always say it. You can make a fool out of the guy. When, when the guy gets mad, if you could get him mad, get him mad. And then you play with him. You play with him when he's mad. And it looked like Catterall and Spots could play with him because he was mad. He was genuinely mad. Like he was running after him. <laughs> like, like I'm, I'm just going to kill him. And he was physically bigger. Like a classic bully. Like he believed. Bully. Like how yeah. dare this guy even well, fight back? I'm going to kill him. He that way. Yeah. Well, he was running after him that way. Uh, he was physically big and stronger. There's no doubt about it. But he didn't use that advantage because he was... He was smothering himself. <laughs> he was running after the guy so fast. When he got inside, all he did was clinch. He didn't even have room to punch, to be effective, to be able to do the things that I, I would suppose he trained to do, but he wasn't able to do those things. So to your point, um, I, th I think he needs to do a little, and the people around him, a little inner, inner searching, inner evaluation, you know, off of that fight. Uh, of where maybe they could tweak things, maybe where they can pull back on things, put the reins on things, you know, uh, get better at certain things, you know. And, and that's where it's important to have honest people around you, not, not just people that want to make money with you so they say whatever you want. You know, that, that just, you know, they go along and they, yes men, right? I guess that's what we're calling them. And not just to have guys that want to survive their job. Guys that are willing, there's not a lot of them. That's right. That are willing to risk their position, their payday, to tell you the truth. Like a parent. Like a parent. That tell you the truth that you have to hear sometimes when it's not going to make you happy at the time. But if you listen... It'll make you happy later on down the road. And we saw that with that prospect, Chris Colbert, uh, not too long ago, a few weeks ago, where he lost. He didn't lose. He got beat up. I mean, he lost just about every round. And he, he lost uh, in that fight. And um, I think it was to Garcia. I'm trying to remember the name of the guy that, that beat Colbert. And Colbert was a big favorite. And Garcia knew how to fight. And he came to fight. He didn't care about the hype. He didn't care about the blue hair. He didn't care about anything except fighting. And doing what he had to do in that ring to win that fight. And the corner... Again, supposed to be your friends, right? Uh, like a surrogate parent, you could say a trainer is. The corner that has that important, that very important responsibility of telling you the truth, telling you what you need to know at the most important time in your life, in that ring, right now. What you need to know to avoid punishment, to be able to get the upper hand. To be able to get to the finish line the way you trained to get to. And he had a trainer who I'm sure he thinks is a good friend of his was lying to him. <laughs> lying to him all yeah. night. Oh, this guy's about to punk up. This guy's a <laughs> punk. Or, or, I mean, ridiculous, absurd stuff. But why is he doing that? Because he wants the guy to like him. Because he don't have nothing else. Maybe it's exposing himself. He don't have nothing else to really give the guy. To give him proper advice. To give him true. But here's the thing. Here's the danger. You're telling that kid, that undefeated Colbert at the time, that this guy's about to punk up. So he's expecting that. 
So he's expected in a way you're telling him, don't worry about fighting. The guy's going to collapse on you. You're going to get it the easy way. Nobody gets anything worthwhile in life the easy way. And you should never tell him that. Even if it comes easy sometimes, you should never tell him that because you should be prepared to do it the way you should always be prepared to do it. To earn it. To be ready to do what you have to do. Not worry about what he's doing and not doing. Be ready to do what you need to do. And by telling him that, by lying to him, and he lied to him all night, but by lying to him that way, as a fighter, you're expecting that. You're expecting the easy way. You're human, like anyone, anyone else. So you're expecting this guy to collapse. And when he doesn't show that, when he doesn't collapse, Ken, you get discouraged. Yep. You start to say, oh, now what do I do? He didn't do what my trainer said. He didn't punk up. What, what do I do? You're not prepared then to do what you should have always been prepared to do, what your trainer should have told you from the beginning that you had to be prepared to do. You shouldn't freaking lie to people in any, any place in life, but especially as a parent, especially in that corner. You, you, should, you should tell them the truth so they're prepared properly for what's coming. And that was Hector Garcia, and good point. And the only th other thing I'd say about Josh Taylor is sometimes it's almost like everyone gets nervous, right? Pe just people handle the nerves differently. And Josh, like he did it against Jose Ramirez. They were getting, after the press conference prior to the fight, they were near an elevator and he comes over and starts getting in his face. And I just think like, you're going to get in the ring and exchange punches in, in 12 hours. Like, cut the shit. Like, you're running the risk that someone's going to get hurt. Before. It's so bush league. I'm like, this. you're not going to scare him. He, this is the surprise fighter. He's going to get in there. But it is showing some of your inner soul. Yep. It is showing some you might not be understanding. You're showing yeah. some of your insecurities. That's you right. don't realize it at the time, yep. but you're looking to make your job easier by intimidating him. That's what you're looking to do. And you're, and you're hoping that he... Here, you're hoping that he'll be a victim to that. You're hoping he'll be susceptible to that. I mean, that's that, that's the truth behind it yeah. at the end of the day. That, and you don't know that you're showing an x-ray of yourself in those dimensions, in those ways. But, you know, ultimately, you are. And, um, and you know, to that fight, Ken, I got you opened the door. I'm sorry, I got to go in there for a second. I had picked Ramirez to win. I was wrong. I was wrong. But... And all those people over there across the pond, they reminded me of that, who I love. And, and I, and, right? And I made crumpets for them. My wife looked it up on the internet. She got, she got the recipe. She bought the utensils for it. And I made homemade crumpets for them. And I ate them with them, you know? And I might have some with them when I go over there in April, you know, to talk and to do the thing that I've been asked to go over there and do and then go to the Fury, the white fight. Yeah, I was wrong. Um, but, and then there should be what's, uh, buts. Again, I'm not getting out. I, I made the crumpets. They, we ate them. Um, I hope they enjoyed them. But he's lucky. I'm telling you, I, I don't care what people say. Uh, I already admitted I, I picked the wrong guy. I thought I picked the right guy because I thought Ramirez was going to beat him. He got dropped. And then I thought Ramirez came back. And he was back in that fight. And then he got dropped a second time with an uppercut. And I know you got to protect yourself at all times. I get it. But sometimes luck's on your side just a little bit in life. And the referee had come in and he tapped Ramirez on the back as though he was telling him to break. And he loosened up his concentration physically and mentally just a little bit on the inside. And Taylor hit him a hell of an uppercut. Uh, it would have knocked a lot of guys out. He hit him a hell of an uppercut. He took advantage of the moment. He dropped him. He got that second knockdown. That kind of put the fight in the bag for him. Um, but even with that, I thought it was a close fight. I thought Ramirez came down the stretch, uh, you know, really came down the stretch strong, uh, showed his great heart. Um, I, I tell you, if, if that doesn't happen, and I know that if certain things, I get it, with the uncles and aunts and all that, I, I, I understand. But if that doesn't happen, my man, Ramirez, I'm right with that pick, and I'm not making crumpets. That's yeah. all. That's all. The, the last thing I'll add is when you talked about uh, teaching moments with Chris Colbert and, uh, and we were talking about emotions, I just had this conversation with my middle son. He's super emotional, but he's very athletic, and I always tried to tell them, like, 
Your emotions aren't necessarily real. It doesn't, because you feel that doesn't mean you're going to react to that. Like once you have that feeling, oh, I'm nervous and I'm scared, just recognize why you have that and, and deal with it calmly. Don't react to the emotion. Like think about why is this happening? Why do I have these feelings? Because everyone has them, right? Everyone has a little bit of fear. It's like the first time someone goes into a boxing gym. If you're not scared when you go in there, there's something is probably wrong with you. Those guys look like they've been doing it for years and... I well, like you've, I've said it all the time. You always heard me say that. You know, if you're, if you're not afraid, you're one of two things. You're either a liar or there's something wrong yeah. with you. you got to go to a doctor to find out what's wrong. Nature or God, whatever you believe in, whatever makes you comfortable, put that there fear for a reason, to prepare you for a difficult situation, for a dangerous situation, for an important situation, to prepare you, to make sure you're ready. It's your job to control that fear and use it, not allow it to control you and destroy you. It's your job as a professional in anything you do, in a boardroom, in a classroom, on a, on a uh, baseball diamond, on a basketball court, in a football field, you, in boxing ring, in MMA, in anything where there's a threat. And it doesn't have to be physical. It could be emotional. You're going on the stage. You're going on the stage. You go, of course. You're going on the stage to perform. When when you get nervous, when you get the butterflies, when you get scared, it's all a form of fear. The problem is we're brought up that that's taboo to talk about. Oh no! If you talk about being afraid, that's going to mean you're a coward. That's going to mean you're yellow. What? Oh, you know, people, that's the terms they used to use. Oh, they call somebody afraid yellow. Oh, you're yellow. You're there. All these stupid terms that got invented. But they're out there. They were out there. And we used to hear them when we were little. And so what happens? A kid decides not to say anything because he doesn't want someone to say he's a coward and that he's all these things that are attached to being afraid. But what also happens is that feeling's still there. It's there for a reason because it was put there for a reason. So now instead of understanding how to control it, now it controls you because you're denying it, because you're afraid to talk about it, because you're ashamed of it. So now what happens? It's still there. It's still knocking at the door. It's still coming over the wall like the ninjas that I always, always talk about, but you don't know how to prepare, how to deal with it because you haven't been given the tools, the understanding by somebody how to deal with it and for me that's what i've always understood was my first job as a trainer and as a parent same thing to teach that to my children to teach that to my fighters and um it's to to your point uh you're teaching that to your kids and that's very important and the last thing i'll say about it there's one other aspect to it ken that you tell your kids the next time you talk about this and you tell them Uncle Teddy uh, said to tell them this part, there's, there's a part of the fear that does the most damage. Just like there's a part of everything, there's a certain part that can do the most damage. And the part of fear that does the most damage is your imagination. That your imagination, and that's what you would describe it without even realizing it. Your imagination starts to attack you. And you start to think that all these things can happen. When in reality, they're not going to happen. They're, they're not going to happen. But your imagination has no ceiling. It has no roof on it. It can go anywhere. The reality is only certain things can happen. That's reality. Like when the bell rings, you go out there and the first punch lands, boom. Boom. Then the fear can go away because now it's something you've done before. It's, it's, it's flesh and blood. It's physical. It's real. It's not your match. Oh, it's a guy throwing punches. I've done this before. It, it, it gets brought back to the real place of what it is. Not what it isn't. See, that's what does all the danger. And right now I'm going with this because I, I want to help the people out there. I want to use this moment maybe to help some people in their own way that's not going to be in an arena, not going to be in a ring, not going to be in a cage, maybe not even be on a football field. In most cases, but they're gonna actually, be in, they're not going to get But they're going to be in their own domain, yep. their own realm exactly. of whatever, wherever that fear takes place, wherever it happens, they're going to be there again tomorrow. And I want them to hear this. I want them to know this, that they can't control it, that your imagination is your enemy, that if you let it go, you know, unbridled, uncontrolled 
It'll go anywhere. It'll go to places that it shouldn't go to, that will take you to places that can destroy you, that keep control over your imagination. That's the key. Keep it real. There's only, no matter what it is you're doing, there's a realm of things that are real and not real. Keep it within that realm. Remind yourself, I've been here before. I've been here before. Only these things can happen. I'm prepared for these things. Don't allow yourself to wander, to wander off the preservation with your imagination taking you off the cliff, taking you to places that are never going to be. That's the thing. And from the first day when we started this podcast and you asked me, you said, Teddy, what do you want to do with this podcast? Obvious talk about fights, break fights down, maybe enlighten people a little bit about things that are going on in the ring and what fighters are dealing with, all of that stuff. Give them something that can make the make watching a fight uh, more enjoyable to them. All those things, answer their questions. But for me, the most important thing was to use something I've been involved in my whole life, a fight that we're all in. Everyone's in a fight. You don't have to have gloves on. You don't even have to be throwing punches. Everyone's in a fight in life. It's just a matter of what you fight for. I said to you, I want to be able in my own little way to be able to connect the dots through boxing, through the thing that I've been in my whole life, to your fight in life. I want to be able to connect the dots with everyone out there in the way that they fight, to maybe help them in some little way. I didn't know we were going to go there today to finish this, but you know what? It's a good thing. It's a good thing. The one thing that I'll add is that I was I I, I love all of that I, I I I repeat that constantly to the kids. But the other thing that I said to them is, everyone has that feeling. That's why when you do something that shows your courage and you take chances and you try something new, that's part of what makes it so admirable in the eyes of other people because they know how much courage it takes, for instance, to go to a boxing gym the first time or to take a jiu-jitsu class when you've never done it. Of course, you're going to look silly. You don't know what you're doing, but only the brave people have the guts to even go there and say, I know I don't know, but I'm going to start from the bottom and learn. And um, yeah, everything you said is accurate. And I think that when, when you're in those situations, you get a chance to demonstrate to the world, to your peers, your family, what courage looks like. They all know you're scared, but even if it's running a marathon and you're not sure you can do it, by doing it, you demonstrate to people you're not afraid to fail. You're not afraid to take chances and put yourself out there. So, yep, to echo everything you said, Teddy, everyone's dealing with fears and everyone's dealing with anxiety. Don't let the anxiety and emotions control your actions. Emotions are feelings. Actions are real world activities. Like, take the first step. If you're thinking of trying something new, get out there and do it. It's failing is part of life. If you don't fail, you're not trying to do anything new. With that, Teddy, thanks for doing this this week. It's great to be with you. You got anything before we say great. goodbye? No, no. I, I was just going to use what you just said um, and just segue off and say we didn't fail today. <laughs> we didn't fail That's today. right. And if you want to learn some new boxing techniques before you get to the gym, go check out the uh, Dynamic Striking video series that Teddy put out. You can learn some of those techniques in the comfort of your own home. If you're nervous about going to a gym, if you've ever considered it, then maybe you take those new learnings and go down to the gym and see what they will look like in practice. And uh, check out the, the Box Raw 36 collection and you can add some uh, boxing gear for when you do go down to the boxing gym for the first time and look like you're a uh, professional. With that, guys, thanks for being with us. Look for that Triple G interview on Thursday. Please like and subscribe the videos. It helps us massively. And don't forget to order your uh, subscription to Athletic Greens uh, using the promo code ATLAS. Thanks, Teddy, and we'll see you guys next week.